Day two of GDC, Rural Tide. It's great, though. Um, thank you so much for joining us both here at bringing open source to game development, or being successful with open source and game development. I didn't manage to change the title on that slide. Uh, important stuff. Um, my name is Mark Mandel. Uh, I tech lead the developer relations team for Google Cloud for Games. No, that is not Stadia. We run a whole bunch of computers that you can use for backends for games. April? <laughs> I don't have a fancy mic because somebody stole one, but um, my name is April Nassi, and I work in the Google Open Source Programs Office. So we have everything to do with all the fun open source stuff, and I get to work with our cloud gaming open source. Sweet. Yes. So yeah, we both work uh, primarily on the back end, but uh, work on open source stuff for games. Um, I think we've had some success in that area. I think we've done okay. Um, so we sort of talk you through some of that and some of this, the patterns we've seen and um, some of the ways that it's going to be useful for you, particularly from like a commercial point of view, both from a company and personal perspective. Um, so we'll get stuck into that, and we'll definitely have some time at the end for some questions. Um, I also need to remember. Yes. Don't forget to fill out your evaluations at the end of the talk, because I'll get in trouble with the GDC crew if I don't remember to say those things. Also, now I know like how good I am at stuff, and that's important. <laughs> Because Mark needs a bigger ego. That's really. I cool. need that. Yes, yes. Follow us on Twitter because how else do I know like my worth as a human being except by my follow account, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> this is going to be a silly talk. Okay, first picture of a dog. Uh, <laughs> before we get started, uh, love to learn a little bit about all of you and your experience with open source as well. Uh, hands up if you feel like you're familiar with open source in general. Okay. More than I expected, but awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, who here has like written some kind of open source software, done a pull request, anything in that sort of vein? Who here considers themselves an open source maintainer? Ooh, a few people over there. All right, we should check. Pretty standard. Yeah. Okay, cool. Who here gets paid to write open source software? Ooh, some all right, all right, cool, cool, cool. Excellent. All right, so bit of a gamut. That's all right. That's good. We're here to talk about all the open source things. So why don't we get stuck in? All right. Over here. So a lot of hands of people who are at least familiar with the concept of open source. But we kind of always like to go back to the very beginning, because when we say the word, it sometimes means a different thing to different people. And the full definition, which is incredibly recursive, is that free and open source software is software that's free and open source. Uh, <laughs> so the question is, like, what does that actually mean? Um, when we say free, we're talking about freely licensed to use it in any way you want, change it, build something on top of it. There's no restrictions on what you can do with this code. And when we're talking about open source, it's the source is open for anyone to modify, use, build on top of, et cetera. Sometimes you'll see things that are open source, but are licensed in a way that you are restricted in what you can do with the project or product. And so that technically is not open source, and that's a fun philosophical debate that we can totally have later if anyone really wants to. <laughs> the real definition, though, is like it's, it's software that's being built collaboratively with, ideally, lots of people working towards the same goal. And because it is freely licensed where Anybody can take it and build something on top of it, make it part of their product, and, and have no restrictions. It means you can basically change the world, which is no small feat, of course, no small goal. Um, but you're able to build on top of what someone else has done and create something even bigger and better. Collaborate where you can, and also use these tools as a stepping stone for the next big thing, and ultimately making industry standards, which is a goal for a lot of open source. You've probably heard of this thing called Linux, also open source. <laughs> um, even things like Chromium, Postgres, you know, a lot of the tools that we're using that maybe don't have the big name like Linux are open source, and they have become the backbone of what we know of as the web. And we're using them every day, 
maybe just not really aware of how much of an ecosystem has been built around it and because that was open source. Second dog photo. Um, we have this idea, of course, you know, we're gonna change the world, we're gonna all work together and be collaborative. It's not actually this magic utopia of tennis balls that are raining down and everything's perfect. Open source is about people and that gets messy sometimes, um, but it's very similar to how we've all been working over the past couple of years, where you're working distributed across multiple time zones, people you maybe haven't met ever, but are now your new best friends. Um, we have to kind of reevaluate how we are working with each other. Um, it does make it tricky at times, and that's some of the uh, pushback we see a lot of times with game studios of you know wanting to have everything in-house and that uh, reluctance to make things fully distributed. But it's a process, it can work, um, but it is you know fully involving having everyone on board and, and willing to work together. Awesome. So both April and I um, come from wider tech before sort of working inside the games industry and particularly open source and uh, wider tech before coming into the games industry. And so I just kind of wanted to highlight as well like the impact and the investment that exists in open source in wider tech versus the games industry. Um, and so the picture I have here is in the before. Uh, well. We seem to be back again, meeting in lots of people, but you know what I mean. Anyway, so this is a picture of a conference called the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, SCNCF. Uh, it's a portion under the Linux Foundation. They run a conference about, that runs for basically things, things for running in the cloud. This is 8,000 plus people all gathering for a single set of open source projects, which is one of four of similar size conferences that are just about these, you know, primarily probably a dozen, there's actually a lot under CNCF, but like primarily a dozen projects that run under here. So that's how much people are willing to invest here. We're also seeing, you know, investment from very large companies like ourselves, Google, Red Hat, IBM, Apple, all working together, spending a lot of money in open source here. So in wider tech, open source is, for lack of a better term, kind of one. We look at some fun statistics. Um, we look at GitHub publishes the state of the Octoverse every year or so, talking about like what's been going on. So in 2021, they added 73 million developers. Um, they added another 254 repositories. Uh, if you're not familiar with open source, a pull request is just sort of a contribution. So 170 million pull requests were merged in 2021. So there's a lot of people out there working on open source for a variety of reasons, commercial, personal, otherwise, et cetera. There's just a huge amount of work that is going into this space in wider tech and software to build this, this foundation of open source that other people can utilize for a variety of really good reasons. So I wanna say something maybe possibly a little bit controversial. Games are software. I know, um, like I know we, we, make, we make amazing art and we tell amazing stories and we do amazing things with games, but they are ultimately software. Um, and so we should definitely, I think, look to other areas of software development to say like, hey, what are they doing over there? And should we take some of the ideas, maybe tweak them a little, that's fine, um, and work them into our pipeline and see what benefits that we can get from them as well. So I think we can talk about open source because I think that's something that's de very much permeated the wider tech community and something we should you know, sort of look at as well in games. Also, I like it a lot. Okay, so let's, let's, like, let's actually like, talk about sort of the commercial aspect to agree, or like the less altruistic idea of it all, which is ultimately like, what's in it for me? Why do I care? What should I even bother? Am I just giving away my work for free? Like, what's in it for me on a personal level? So I think there's some really interesting stuff in like around just generally what motivates us as human beings. Um, I'm sure you can all just take down that, that URL. Um, there's a great RSA anime talk that talks about like what motivates us human beings. But there's three things that actually really resonate with me uh, that I think align really well with open source. So the first is autonomy, right? Like being able to do the thing you want to do. Strangely enough, if you're running your own open source project, you can do what you like. That's awesome. That makes me feel good about myself. Mastery, the ability to learn something new. Open source is a wonderful vehicle. We'll talk about this more, about how to educate yourself and learn things and do something interesting and new. 
as well as purpose. Maybe there's a problem you want to solve, something you specifically want to work on. Having a sense of purpose is generally just a wonderful feeling as a human being to motivate us to do more. Okay, so that gives us a bit of a sense of like some things that might possibly motivate us as human beings and make us feel good about ourselves and like help us grow and do all that sort of good stuff. But let's, let's really talk commercial. So if I'm a company and you know, I wanna, maybe you're in that company and they're like, we wanna do open source. And we'll be like, but why? And usually at that point you can't just go, because I like giving away things for free. And your company goes, no, that seems like a bad idea. So having a good reason why you want to open source things is generally a good thing. So I'm going to give you a whole bunch uh, as a company. Um, you can pick and choose the ones that may necessarily work for you and the project that you're looking at. And we'll also dig into some of these reasons as well when we go through some of the projects we work on as well, so you'll get a bit of a sense that way. First things first, wider talent pool. Um, it's great when you work inside a team and maybe you have, I don't know, pick a number, 10 people inside your team that are working on a particular project. Open source is a wonderful opportunity not just to be like, hey, now we have a thousand people working on this project, which happens in some of the projects I work on, but also just having a variety or a wider variety of skill sets, perspectives, um, experience to come into your project and help drive it towards being the better or more ideal goal of whatever your project is. So having access to that wider talent pool is really handy just to basically build a better product ultimately resulting in a better product for you to use, but also a better product for everyone to use. Rising tide lifts all boats. It wouldn't be an open source talk if we didn't at least mention rising tide lifts all boats at least once. It's one of those things, you just have to do it. Another one, this is the one actually, one of the ones I actually like a lot, is about setting the standard. Um, hands up here somebody who's written a piece of software three times or more. Right? Who, who really likes doing that? Nobody. Okay, good. I was worried for a second. Um, open source, and this is something that I feel like I've done in some places, is um, setting the standards. So if you can get an open source project out into the world, that's good. Usually a good start. And yes, you'll need to do some marketing, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But if you can get adoption at the right rate for that open source project, you can start to set the standard for how those things are done inside the industry. This is both cool uh, because it sets your company apart from other companies and you control that standard because it's coming from you, at least generally in the outset. Um, but it also therefore helps as well when you're like, how do we onboard people? How do we bring people into this company? How do we know that when we hire people, they're gonna have the skills they need to work on the particular tools we have internally? If you have a standard and you've set that standard through open source, suddenly you can see like all the people that are using that tool. It starts showing up on resumes. You can start saying, oh, they use this new Acme widget thing that we released. They've had three years experience. They're gonna slot right into our team. That's gonna make that really easy. So I really like the idea of setting the standard through open source. That's a, one that gives me warm and fuzzies. Open source is also just a really nice way of raising the visibility of your company. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about hiring as well, but in that aspect, it's also kind of nice. Um, we definitely see that a lot of gaming companies out there have like engineering blogs, for example, and talk about some of the tech they use, but I don't think, you know, like, there's nothing that really replaces being able to actually see the code that comes out of a company and some of the people they work on, as well as actually also seeing, maybe for better or worse, how that company interacts with people who also, you know, work on those engineering projects inside the team. Um, I was gonna talk about this before, but uh, one of my favorite companies that does open source work is Embark Studios. You can literally go to embark.dev, you can see all the projects they have right there that they work on in open source, which I think is just super cool. Um, and they do some really amazing work, both that they run in production and they do research on. Um, and I think it's just a really cool thing that differentiates them in the industry, um, just in terms of like what they do as well as how they do it. I really like that. Okay, hiring, and I put an asterisk on this. <laughs> Open source is an avenue for hiring, right? You put out an open source project, you have people who come and contribute, they may join whatever chat room you're in, um, they join your community meetings, you get a good sense of them as they interact with other human beings in the team as well as what their technical prowess is. Awesome, that sounds great. Let's do all our hiring that way. No, please don't. Um, yes, it is a great opportunity to enhance your hiring pipeline. 
Um, but it is also worth noting that if we look at the people in our lives that have a lot of free time that they may not necessarily, you know, sorry, that they have a lot of free time that they can put towards open source um, that does skew towards particular demographics. Um, for example, people who don't have families, often not, for example, they not necessarily have that free time. Um, so I usually say, yes, put it in your hiring pipeline, just don't make it the hiring pipeline. Also, don't make it so that like, you have to have a GitHub open source repository to be hired. Like, some people don't have that opportunity, um, but it is, it is an avenue that you can use as a hiring tool for your company uh, that is a you know, really nice way to vet people before they come in. So we talked a little bit commercially about, um, as a company, let's talk also, like, we talked a bit about motivation as an individual, but like, let's talk probably a little bit more commercial or a little bit more, also less altruistically in some ways. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, who here has cut a corner so something can go to production? If you haven't put your hand up, you're lying, um, which is fine. So I think open source is like one of those wonderful opportunities wherein you're like, I really wish I had the time and the patience to sit down and do this the right way, whatever that happens to be, right? Traditionally, like in open source, you don't necessarily have customers, um, but you, know, you, you build the thing that you need to build and it gets done right and you wanna push it forward, especially if you're working with a diverse set of people. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about governance in a bit, but like, Usually there's some kind of consensus that goes on, and so like, you're trying to get yourself to whatever that best point is in that system. You will incur technical debt, like you're never gonna get away from that, but I think it's just a better opportunity towards that ideal goal without some of the corporate pressures or top-down pressures you might otherwise get from um, internal, like, internal pressures inside your corporation or shipping on a certain time. It's not to say you can always get away with it, but I think it's a, it's a, it is a way of sort of escape valving that a little bit. Job security. So we also talked a little bit about setting the standard as a company. Um, it's also a nice opportunity as an individual. If you can be part of either making or participating or being a maintainer or just even using an open source piece of software that becomes a standard, that's an easily transferable skill that you can take to other companies, for example. If you helped build the tool, and you now know that 10 other companies are using it, that's now 10 other companies that you can go apply to and be like, hey, I'm the one that built that thing. You should hire me, I'm worth money. Please give me money. Um, so that is, like, that is a good thing. Um, I forgot where I was gonna go with that. Anyway, that's fine. <laughs> money, good. money good, money just good. Um, but yeah, having that job security, like that being able to transfer from place to place, that is just a good thing in general. Um, and again, that also means that then you can onboard into that company faster, you get up to speed faster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's always a nice thing. Leading on into that, exactly, hiring opportunities. Like we said, when with a company, right, that's an opportunity for you to bring people in. If you go and you go and look and you're like, oh, this company has open source projects. Maybe I'll go try out and see what it's like to basically work there. Um, I can interact with people on that team. I can see how they respond, how they communicate, what sort of technical stuff they do. It gives me an opportunity to learn about them, at their company, their culture, et cetera. Um, in, you know, I have to put in some effort, but it's a low risk way. Uh, often the only way of doing that is usually by joining the company. That's a little bit riskier. And education. Open source is a wonderful way to learn stuff. Um, there are areas of game development where the education is awful, which is unfortunate. Um, I work, like, I work particularly in back-end game dev. Um, the education there is awful. I will attest to that. I'm trying to change that with the summit we run on Monday. Um, but open source brings together a community. And they are, and open source is a community, right? I mean, it's not just chat rooms and just pull requests and that kind of stuff. But you get to know the people who are in the community you get to converse with them, you get to share ideas, you're all building designs together towards features. So the opportunity exists there to participate in that community and then learn from each other. Um, we'll go into some of the examples here, but there's just been some wonderful places where on some of the open source projects we work on that I've not actually seen that many people with those particular skill sets be in the same place at the same time from that big a diversity of companies and help share their knowledge. 
Um, and I just think that's an incredible opportunity that I just don't see any other way, unfortunately. Back to puppies. <laughs> Australian shepherd lovers, yes. So we have a saying in open source that when we say it's free, it's free as in a puppy. Um, sure, you can have it, but you have to take care of it and feed it and train it and watch it like a hawk after it has surgery, which is what I've been doing with mine for the past week. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we're you know, really trying to teach folks is how to best bring open source into your company, your practices, and how you can do that in the best way. To start off with, contributions don't have to be code. Um, when we talk about contributions and pull requests, like we give you all these great stats from GitHub. We love GitHub. Um, so, you know, it's great that we've got that, but I want to be very clear that contributing to an open source project is not just limited to a pull request or an issue that someone can make on GitHub. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, there are the marketing needs of, great, you've created this brand new open source project. It's going to revolutionize the industry. Who knows about it? Um, you can't just throw it on GitHub and expect that the masses will come and develop it with you. So if you are someone that maybe is, you know, involved in the other aspects of working at a studio or a company, this is a great way to get involved. Remember that it's not just the developers. Um, you also need legal folks to help with licensing and compliance. That's what the Open Source Programs Office does at Google to make sure that our lovely developers don't get too crazy when they give things away for free. Um, and then of course, we have people like Mark and John and Emma who go and talk about these amazing projects and can you know, spread the word and, and talk to customers and other potential users of the projects and explain how they work. And then of course, the big one that we really love the most is writing. Every open source project <laughs> needs help with documentation. Literally was having the conversation earlier today about one of our projects. If you're someone that loves to write, boy, do we have opportunities for you. Um, particularly if you know, you're someone who is maybe interested in getting involved in to the games industry, maybe you're just peripheral and you're still here, which is awesome. Um, this is a great way to connect with you know, some of the studios and, and folks that are working in the space and build those relationships. And I will promise you, if you are any sort of tech writer, every open source project will welcome you with open arms. <laughs> Um, and, you know, if you're someone who is primarily developer, but maybe you want to try out some of these other roles, like, you know, doing more of the speaking or working on project management or tech writing, here's a great opportunity to do it. You know, if you can't do it in your day job, come on over to open source. We would love to have you work on any number of projects. So let's say you're, you know, you're sold, right? You're like, this is awesome. Thank you, Mark and April, for teaching me about the wonders of open source. I'm ready to go get involved. So first step is read the contributing guide and then actually follow it. Um, every project has a contributing guide. It's usually a readme. There's going to be like a governance.md, something like that. That's basically going to tell you, okay, great. You're here. You want to get involved. Here's how to do it. Governance is a scary word, um, but it doesn't need to be. And I like to tell folks, you know, obviously, as we'll cover later, we're kind of partial to Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is a great project with a whole lot of people that contribute, and its governance is very reflective of that. For most projects, when they're just starting out, you do not need that level of oversight. So if you're just starting a project in your own company, the best step is to just document how you're making decisions today and then go from there. You can always add to it. Think of it like the Constitution, but it's way easier to edit. <laughs> um, but you want to have some basic ground rules for people in terms of how to get involved and how to connect with the community, especially now that we're pretty much all remote and we're dealing with different time zones. Things like pinging someone on Slack is not going to work. So when you're talking with these big global communities, got to have some guidelines in place. So definitely 
with any project, if you're starting one, make sure you outline that at the start. And if you're joining one, figure out what the community does, get involved. And then once you're in there for a while, then you can propose some changes if you'd like. And be transparent. This is not something that is second nature to the games industry. So weird, right? Um, open source thrives on transparency. <laughs> there are no secrets. Um, you know, it's all out there for everyone to see the good and the bad. And the reason for that is because that's the only way we can get anything done. And gaming is, of course, one of those industries that we tend to keep things close because we're working on something cool. We don't want anybody to know just yet. It doesn't work with open source. So it is a culture shift that does have to happen. It is one of the most important values in open source behind that and people. <laughs> Um, the big thing is to think about how decisions are being made, making sure that you're giving the opportunity for everybody to get involved, and that you're explaining why a decision was made. You know, as Mark mentioned, like, when working on open source, you get all these different perspectives in, which is awesome, but they've got to be able to get in and give you their feedback and their use cases, and you have to make it easy for everyone to do that. Did we mention documentation? Uh, so, the key for any open source project, it could be the greatest idea in the world, but if nobody knows how to use it, it's not going to go anywhere. So, if transparency is the first thing, your docs should definitely be second. Um, think about the people that are checking out your project. What do you want them to know? What it is, what you're trying to do, and how to get involved. Put that somewhere, <laughs> make it easy. There was a session earlier talking about your readme should not be like 20 pages long. Keep it short and to the point. Always you can you know, add more as you go, but keep it very simple for your new users. And whenever you get someone new that's working on the project, they are inevitably going to hit blockers or friction points. Encourage them to keep a friction log to report errors and things that they have run into. This is an easy contribution, especially if you're someone looking to get involved in open source. Pick a project, go through their documentation, try to do the you know, examples and the test cases, and when you hit a bug, which you probably will, report it, because we love that. And then there's your first contribution. Congratulations, you have contributed to open source. Start small. There's a lot. <laughs> um, you know, open source is a big area. Uh, we're working on making it even bigger in gaming. Um, and it can be overwhelming. And a lot of times when you're looking at a big project, it's overwhelming in terms of where to get started. Just start small. Pick a project. Pretty much all of them have a mailing list, a Discord, Slack, whichever. Jump in and just say hi. Um, we're happy to have you. We're thrilled. Um, sometimes it just feels like shouting into the void, so please come and say hi to us. Um, find something that you want to work on, and I think this is something that I know um, as the lead maintainer for one of our projects, Mark is very passionate about, of it. like if you say you're going to do it, please do it. Um, that's a huge part of just the follow through. So if you join a project and volunteer to take something on, you will be the best person in the world to get it across the finish line and get that knocked out for the project. Everyone will love you. Um, don't be scared. <laughs> it is a lot. There's a whole lot going on. Um, I know we're going to jump into some of the examples of, of things that we've done, just some projects that maybe if you want you know, to contribute to, you can. Um, I also uh, will put in a, a shout out for, um, I know Ruth is leading an IGDA uh, roundtable about open source game development here on Thursday. Um, so definitely, if you want to talk more with other people that are doing open source, find more opportunities to get involved, that is also a great place to do it. I believe you're going to take over now. This is your baby. Oh, these are my babies. Okay. So. Um, what I'm going to do is take you through it's probably about four examples of some of the projects we work on at Google Cloud. Um, what they actually do for the sake of this talk doesn't actually matter. Um, I'll give you a heads up. What I want to focus on is I want to sort of highlight 
some of the ways these projects have done some of the things we were talking about previously, um, and some of the interactions that we've had inside that community, and, and, and how like, I think they've been successful. I think they've been really good. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first one is, yeah, the project that I, one of which I founded and continue to maintain on. Uh, it's a project called Agones. It runs game servers on top of another project called Kubernetes. It's open source all the way down. Not important. Um, the thing that I love about this project so much is that um, we initially started it with Ubisoft. It was one of the coolest things I've probably done in my career in that it was a melding of two I don't want to say disparate, like we, we both had knowledge in both areas, but like expertises and like good expertises. So like I came from Google Cloud, we understood like the infrastructure side of things really well. And obviously Ubisoft had a really good understanding of how like games work. Right? And so it was a real, just a fortuitous sort of coming together of those two things to create something that I, I actually genuinely feel well, is, is growing to be the standard for how we do this sort of stuff. Um, Feel free to disagree, that's fine. Well, a lot of people like it, it's great. Um, and from there, it's grown. This is a subset of some of the logos we have um, on the website. We have a bunch more, but we've had, oh, I actually looked at this. I think we've had over 120 contributors to the project so far. I feel like it could be more, I can't remember. Um, from all kinds of game studios, and each of them have brought different needs, different wants. Um, some of them are building certain types of multiplayer games, other building very different types of multiplayer games. And we've been able to just leverage that community to build what I think is a really, really, really cool product. Um, I'm super, super proud of it. But none of that would have been possible if it wasn't for the diversity of expertise and perspectives that came together to form this. Um, it just, I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own, even with the people inside Google. Um, I think it's just, it really was all of us coming together. And that's probably not also from a technical perspective, but also from, like you were talking about, like part of my job is to go out and like talk to people about this stuff and do that external storytelling. So I could able to do that while taking, you know, that wasn't on the game company itself. It was all of us coming together and bringing all those bits together. I was able to leverage the experience we have with external facing developer experience teams that we have inside Google Cloud. Um, you know, and that kind of stuff. So there was, it really was a lot of really good stuff coming together. And I think that's true actually for all the projects that we're gonna talk about, but I'm gonna dig into some other aspects on some of those as well that I think, that I think are super cool and just very exciting. So this is another fun project. Um, open Match, it's an open source framework for matchmaking. Um, it was built uh, initially also a collaboration between Unity and Google. You'll see a pattern here. Um, very much the same thing that we were talking about before. Um, if you ever want to talk about it more, my buddy John's sitting right there. But the thing that I love about this probably the most is we have monthly community meetings for Open Match. Um, matchmaking is such a wonderfully niche topic. Maybe not wonderfully, maybe it should be a little bit, again, the education should be better, I feel. But there is so much knowledge in these kind of silos in all kinds of different spots. And when you'd go to the community meetings for Open Match, and like I don't do anything with matchmaking, but I love going to the community meetings because there's just this dearth of knowledge there of people, and they're all comparing notes with each other about how certain features should work because this is how matchmaking works at their company, and this is how it happens at this company, and these are the kind of features they need there. And it's the sort of knowledge that, quite honestly, doesn't get shared that often, um, which, is, which is sad, but also it is just a wonderful opportunity to get that, that sharing across. Um, and I've, yeah, I've never actually seen it. Like, particularly for this project, I've never actually seen it that much. Yeah. We're also a fun group of people to hang out with. I hope you believe that. <laughs> Another fun project. Where's Emma? She works on this. Excellent. Very much similar story once again. It's the, it's the collaborative atmosphere of what's happening here. So OpenSaves is an opinionated cloud-native store for um, data and storage for games. Um, coordinated between Google Cloud and 2K Games. Same thing again, uh, working on this type of problem, again, variety of different perspectives coming together to work on this kind of stuff, um, enabled us to build something really neat, and I really like it. This is another one I worked on, because apparently I have way too much free time, um, or don't like weekends, I don't know, it's fine. <laughs> but uh, this is an open source proxy for games, um, for UDP traffic. 
been building this with Embark Studios, some incredibly talented people over there. Um, the thing I want to highlight on this one that I also particularly love, um, my expertise is not in like UDP network sync and like UDP traffic for games. That is not something I'm particularly like super, super strong with. Um, but I had some really good, I had some ideas. We had some ideas. Several of us had some ideas. There was a few of us working on this for sure. But I've been able to learn so much from the work with Embark that I particularly want to talk about. Like the education that I've been able to gain from that specifically. I've got huge amounts of experience with infrastructure stuff, but this was not so much. But starting this open source project, working on it with a bunch of people who are extremely talented, um, has been an, an incredible learning opportunity just for me specifically that I absolutely adore. Um, and we'll be ever thankful, actually, to Embark for, for the work that we've done together. OK, so those are some of the things we work on and some of the, like, the, um, the reasons why I, which I think they're particularly special projects and some of the benefits that we've got from that. Um, I think overall we've got pretty much the goals that we've, we've highlighted for many, many things in there across those projects. But that's the sort of stuff we work out. Um, do want to point you to some resources that we think are particularly useful. Um, there is some good stuff out there. Uh, the top one could potentially be the most important, uh, contributorcovenant.org. If you're looking for a code of conduct and you want to use one that is used in a variety of places, um, please have a code of conduct on all your projects. Please enforce it. That is also really useful and important. Um, that is a great place to go and just grab one. Um, you can tweak it. It's a great place to start if you just want to have one. If you need to make changes after the fact, also totally fine. Um, but Contributor Covenant is used, I feel like it's used on Linux. Am I correct on that? It's used in a bunch of places. Probably it's been. It's probably been tweaked since then. Things, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a good, it's a good code of conduct. Um, outside of that, uh, opensource.org, opensource.guide, opensource.dev. I can never remember which one's the GitHub one. Anyway, out of those few, each one of those is from a different group, but they go through things like even just down to what's a pull request, how do I do open source, let me talk about licensing, um, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's all kinds of guides in through all those. So if you just type open source dot TLD of some kind, you'll pretty much get to a good place. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to dig deeper or you need more information, that kind of stuff as well, that's great. You can also go to opensource.google.com. We have most. Uh, All of our internal open source documentation is externally available. Do you want to say that into the mic so that it gets recorded? <laughs> All of our internal documentation on how we do open source at Google is externally available. Um, so we walk the talk there with keeping it transparent. And it's also probably needing some updating. So let me know <laughs> if you find anything. But yeah, that's literally a copy of what we use internally. Yep. And that's not to say that you have to do it the way we do it, but you can, you can see what's going on there. Um, finally, the last one at the bottom, um, you touched on Open Source Program Office. Do you want to explain what that is really quickly? I know I'm putting you on the spot. No. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, when you think of open source, there are, yes, the code, but there's the licensing agreements that have to go in place. There's building an ecosystem around a project. There's you know, helping other projects uh, with some of the things that they might need that a company like Google is happy to provide. And so that's what the Open Source Programs Office, at most companies, we're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, and then specifically, my role is working with our gaming and, and cloud native projects, um, looking for ways we can basically give back to the open source community. And actually, I'll, I'll highlight one other thing on that as well, which is like, um, you track a lot of the metrics as well around what we do. So like when you actually sit down as a company and say like, why are we doing open source? Having a, an office, and it, again, I say office. It could be a spreadsheet in one person. Um, but being able to track that you're actually doing the things you want to do that you say you want to do and get the benefits for, that's always kind of useful. So to that last point, there is a todogroup.org, which I refer to as like an open source programs office in a box. Um, it's a great place to start if you want to start that kind of program and see what sort of metrics you want to track and sort of all the guidance you need to have inside that as well. Cool. Um, some highlight, just some other really cool open source game dev projects that are out there. I mean, I'm sure many of us heard of Godot. That's awesome. 
Um, I think they're doing amazing work. There's also on the engine front, like Stride3D, O3D.org. Um, I'm particularly excited in some of the open source stuff that's been happening in the Rust ecosystem for gaming uh, with Bevy Engine and a whole bunch of other stuff in there. We talked about uh, what Embark.dev is doing. They do a lot of Rust stuff. Uh, what am I missing? There's so many cool things. Calesius is a, language, it's a framework for doing multiplayer games. Twinery is an open source tool for doing narrative. Uh, we've all heard about Blender. I don't know why it's not on this list. Um, Nakam. OK, yes, smaller. yeah, it's smaller. That works too. Um, so yeah, there's, there's actually a huge amount of open source out there and available. Um, if it's something that you want to get involved with and you're like, what's an area I want to grow myself possibly, you can probably find an open source project that you can work with. Finally, as just like a call to action. And our last dog. And our, yeah, it is our last dog, actually. Um, let's just talk about open source more. Um, I would love to hear more about it at conferences, at meetups, on blogs. Uh, if you're working with open source and you have an engineering blog or you're at a conference, I'd love to hear people talk about it. We talk about it a lot as in the infrastructure side because that's what all our stuff is built on, but I think there's probably room for so much more uh, to be talked about, about what open source is being used across the entire gamut um, of gaming and game development. Let's just hear what you're creating, what, you're, what cool things you're working on, all that kind of fun stuff. And talk to us about it because that's what we love. And if you have questions, we are here to answer. Yes. We Thanks. also have stickers. Oh yeah, um, since you're here, uh, my business cards, some of April's business cards, and a bunch of stickers from the projects we work on are down on the table at the front, so feel free to grab some as well if you wanna do that. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for yeah. spending time with us. We really appreciate you taking the time. We know you're busy people at GDC, but um, otherwise, yeah, open to questions. Open to questions. <laughs> can also harass us on Twitter. That's um, true. If you, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, we have them all there. Yeah. We're, this is literally what we do all the time. So we will happily talk about open source. Over there. Do, do you have any uh, support uh, that you offer to, like, I'm a high school teacher of coding, and I, I'm a software writer myself, never really done uh, much outside of Moodle, which is an open source project. but. Um, I'm looking for ideas for a high school teacher to get students like into their first like open source hello world. I know Google does education like you did this partnership with Coursera, but it's behind a paywall to learn Python for IT. Okay. You know, but I'm looking like if Google really wants more open source engineers, why not have like an open source uh, course? Yeah. You know. I so, know that we recently just did a, an update of our open source website. And that is one of the things that we are looking to do is kind of also bring some of attention to some of our different projects that do have things like that. Um, I would be surprised if there's not something on the DevRel side that you guys have done before. I have genuinely no idea. You're supposed to know everything? Uh, yeah, I don't. You're just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would also say, I mean, in terms of like, you know, trying to get to, um, you know, get high school age interested. Um, you know, language wise, Rust is what all the cool kids are working on these days, but I don't know if that's the easiest. Doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, feel free if you want to um, grab my card, we can connect afterwards. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Hello, and thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, I'm a student who's very interested in doing open source projects, but I am concerned about the economics of pursuing those out of school. So you okay. briefly mentioned doing open source work for pay, and I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about that ecosystem. So when you say you're concerned about the economic aspect, are you talking about like trying to make money from open source? Because Red Hat will tell you, you can absolutely do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm primarily concerned with paying off my student loans. Those are just going to go away, right? That's what I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot, one of the things that I really like about open source is it is a great way to kind of test the waters before you commit to making something your career. Um, I can speak from Google's perspective and, you know, Ruth from Red Hat is here. They do, a, they do a ton in open source. So a lot of the big tech companies, we're all hiring engineers and we are paying them to work on open source. 
Um, so there's a huge opportunity in that space. And I think particularly, you know, we're trying to make it more synonymous in the game industry, but I think, you know, we definitely are working with obviously some studios that see the value and, you know, by you wanting to get involved, you're able to kind of use that as like a resume and show that I actually do know what I'm talking about. I really can code. <laughs> um, and that can lead to, you know, a great opportunity in terms of jobs. And it's also making connections because, you know, aside from events like this, it's really hard to just kind of randomly bump into people that are working in gaming. Um, but like to Mark's point, some of the, you know, communities and relationships that we've built on some of these open source projects, like that would not have happened otherwise. And that is our favorite part of all of this. And so I highly recommend for anybody who's just interested in the industry and exploring it to get involved with things like that. Well, yeah, I've got some. Uh, so the other side of that is probably also, there's a wide variety of monetization models, if that's something you're interested in, in terms of like open source, even down to like the individual person. Yeah. So, like before I joined Google, I was a consultant, and the re reason I got consulting gigs was because I, I wrote and maintained a particularly popular open source project that a lot of people used. So I sold support contracts and contracting services and that kind of stuff. So like I could use that as a medium. Um, GitHub now has I want to call it GitHub sponsors. Mm -hmm. Yep. So like they, you can take direct payments that way. You can do things like Patreon. There's all kinds of different monetization models that you can explore with open source as well. There's a just... lot of venture capital interest in open source right now. <laughs> So, That's also a thing. So yeah, just throw that out there again. And but it is depend. Some of that is dependent on being able to set the standard and become the popular thing. Yeah. And that takes time, effort. Um, that sort of thing. But like just like anything else. So there are there are a variety of opportunities out there. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. I have a question in regards to licensing. Ooh. So um, in regards to like obviously the game industry is very secretive in the way they do things. So some licensing. Uh, that in particular is designed to encourage a lot of contributions are the ones that they absolutely refuse to touch. Yep. So how do you balance those kind of like, uh, you know, licenses that encourages contributions versus licenses that doesn't? So I, let's clarify one very particular point here. You say encourages contributions. What I assume you mean by that is something like a GPL or an LGPL. Right. Yes. So anyone not familiar, that's a license that basically sells. If you do any, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so let me make sure I say that up front. Say, always preface um, that, yes. And I'll make sure I get this as close as possible. But basically they're saying, if you make any modifications to this source code, you need to give that source code back to where it came. A lot of commercial, uh, big commercial companies won't touch that because they are integrating with proprietary systems. Um, there, one could also argue when you say uh, licenses that encourage collaboration and contribution, something like an Apache or MIT, which is basically like do with it what you will. Right. You could argue encourage co contributions because there is a, there a more quote unquote free license for whatever that means. Um, the short answer, yeah, if you put out something as LGPL or, or GPL license or anything of that kind of nature, most corporations probably won't touch it. Yeah, and, and the reason is a lot of it is just the sheer like the dependency tracking that has to happen, yeah. you know, from speaking in an open source programs office, like if we're going to use something that has a license like that, we now have to track in 20 different places that it's at, have license agreements and all of this. It's not impossible, but it can be done. Um, the other element that, you know, I see a lot is it's someone at a studio who wants to contribute to a project, but you're having to sign a contributor license agreement, which is usually, you know, you're, you're giving the project, you're licensing what you've written to the project to use. And that is scary to a lot of companies. Um, the simple solution for that is I let the lawyers talk to each other. Um, and they usually work it out and then they're fine. Um, because a lot of times these are, you know, these agreements are legal documents and they are designed to protect people. And, you know, Google's is not the easiest. We know it. However, ours is the only one that's been tested in the Supreme Court. So, um, you know, there's a reason it's complex, um, but when there are those kind of questions, we're just able to kind of, you know, have that one-on-one -on -one and, and break down some of the barriers. But yes, absolutely, a lot of times people look at stuff like that and are just like, it's too hard, I can't do it. Was that helpful? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, well, licensing is a really, like, there's a ton of complicated yeah. factors. I would also say um, the uh, open source um, site, literally breaks down like the definition. If you use XYZ license, you are not technically an open source project. Um, and so it specifically calls it out, and that's a good resource to look at for 
you know, when we talk about open source and talk about what is and what isn't, there literally is a definition that will tell you yes or no. And yeah, open source licensing could be a whole talk in and of itself. And it is, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this amazing talk. So I have a question about um, some of the open source projects that you know is already on the market right now. So uh, I, I know that you briefly mentioned the Rust community and you know the Bevy engine, and a lot of those uh, projects are maintained by a single person, and they're really having a hard time because they quit yep. their job and they have to do this full time. And my question is, are there any uh, opportunities or funds uh, in Google or any, any other funds that you are aware of that will help those people mm -hmm. to keep what they're doing and uh, you know, you know, giving back to the oh, open yeah. source community? Yeah, I mean, I'll give a quick plug for Google has, um, we, have a, we have a peer bonus program that is done. You know, we have, it's a concept internally, um, but we've turned it into external. Um, so we have an open source peer bonus. We do it twice a year. And basically it's, you know, if you're, doing amazing things in open source, you get nominated, the committee picks, and you get money. Um, there's also the Season of Docs program, which is where we are basically, you know, doing the program for people to contribute to projects, and, and it is, I think there's a stipend, but I forget exactly the extent. And there's Summer of Code, which is similar, but specifically focused on code. Um, and then specifically for projects, absolutely. We can help with, you know, cloud computing credits because uh, we have a few of those servers laying around, um, and we can help with all sorts of different, um, you know, programs that we either have existing or can benefit. You know, um, we certainly are involved in a lot of the big open source foundations. There's things we can do through that. Um, any project that is interested, please reach out to me. I actually oh, yeah. have. No, I mean, I literally. <laughs> I have um, a regular meeting with the person in Google's OSPO that runs a lot of these programs, and I have come to him with my list for this year of, you know, the big ones that we, that I know of that need help. But like you said, the past couple of years have been so hard on everyone, but especially on open source maintainers. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is very much a big focus for us is just the sustainability aspect. And yes, wherever we can help, we are very happy to. So. Um, if my cards are gone, just grab Marks and harass him. Um, he'll point you to me. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. That was yeah. uh, really helpful. Yeah. Thank right. you. Hi. Hello there. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I recently worked on a project where we ported quite an old game, Eve Online, and we took it to work on macOS, and it was always a Windows-only uh, game. As part of that, the developers actually gave quite a bit back to the open source community because we actually use a lot of uh, libraries that are open source as part of the game. Awesome. And a lot of the conversations we've actually recently had at the company is about how can we actually open source parts of our game? And does it make sense for us to do this? And one of the problems we've hit fairly early on is that a lot of our code base relies on proprietary software. Mm. So for example, mm. our renderer relies on uh, something called Granny, which is used for models, and Y is for audio. So the source code on its own may not actually be that useful without the propriety aspect of that. Should we still even examine open sourcing some of this, or is that a showstopper that at that point? I have, I have, I have opinions. Um, so I have, I have opinions about like, what makes a good open source project. Um, and we saw it actually kind of in a slide there. Um, for me, usually I look at things, I refer to like a good open source project as usually plumbing, right? Like if you look at somebody's house, you don't like walk in and be like, wow, those are some nice pipes. Like, you, you know, you look at like, what is the wall color and like, what's the furniture look like? But if the house doesn't have plumbing, that's a big problem. Actually, I had that problem a little while ago. It was great. It was not good. Um, so I really like foundational pieces, right? And I think those are also easy to open source because you're looking at, you're like, I'm not giving away what gives, makes my game fun, or what, well, I'm not giving away what gives me a technical advantage. I'm giving away the foundational building blocks that everyone builds and everyone knows anyway, so let's just work on it together because it's great. So when you ask, like, should we give away this particular bit, I would almost say, like, is that particular bit plumbing? Um, and if it is, and it is hooked into proprietary stuff, is there a way you could turn that into something generic that we could all use and all work on together? Does that kind of answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, because I think a lot of the value of our game actually just comes from the database side and the interaction and the community. Yep. And this is definitely something that we've, we've been exploring. But on the back of that, just one other quick question, and that is one of the concerns that people have raised internally is if we, we examine this and it progressed a bit more. Um, how do you feel about the costs of dealing with things like pull requests or when people want to add features? Because yes. that, from our initial discussions, could actually work out quite expensive for us. Yep. There is a cost. Please see the earlier question of maintainers that are burnt out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the age old question. Um, you know, the, every open source has the problem of there's a, one maintainer who everything is in their head a lot of times. Um, and if they leave, we're stuck. Um, we're seeing a decline in contributions across open source because, again, the world. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we're really trying to you know, address. What I tell teams within Google that want to open source is be very clear up front with what your level of engagement is going to be. It's not a, you know, you don't have to promise an SLA. But if you're putting a project out there with the intent of, hey, it's here, it's cool, you can use it, but I'm probably not gonna look at any pull requests, that's totally valid, but say it up front. It goes back to the transparency piece. Um, because there's nothing that, you know, disappoints someone more <laughs> than finding a really cool tool, but finding out it hasn't been touched in years, and there's all these open issues. But if you're clear up front with the expectation, you not only will find that there's people that are willing to jump in and help out, but you know, you're not going to set the wrong impression with someone when they do come you know, expecting the experience to be just like something they had in another open source project, only to find out that you just can't. Um, it is expensive. It's a toll on people. You know, if you're a maintainer, a lot of people that do this as a labor of love is a huge toll on them. And that's where, you know, the big companies, we try to help where we can. Um, even the ones that are being paid, like Mark can tell you, like, it's still a toll. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you're dealing with a lot of people and a lot of different competing interests and requests. It's tough. Um, definitely factor that in. Um, there is, you know, I, I deal with this a lot with like, well, we're just going to open source this and then like everybody's going to come and develop it, right? And I'm like, no, that's not how this works. Um, but just be very clear up front with this is what we've done and this is the way we're able to respond and contribute. And I feel like you are hopping because you want to say something. Sorry, right. yeah. No, no, I was waiting. I was trying to wait patiently. I'm like a puppy dog. I apologize. Um, that is, no, absolutely. That's 100% like really, really useful. Um, I go back as well to like, this is why it's also super important to understand why you're open sourcing it. Have metrics around it and track those metrics. Because if you're like, we're going to start open sourcing things and like, we're like, this is taking up this person's time so much. But if you're like, but look at these numbers for the, like, I don't know, we're getting so many contributions and like making our product so much better and now we're able to do these seven other things we couldn't do before, suddenly that cost is completely and utterly justified. Um, it's only if you can't justify the cost that it actually becomes a problem. So just make sure you have those things up front um, and, you know, check in on them regularly and like if, you know, you're, you've been doing it for a year and you're just not getting back the return that you're looking for, you can always archive a project. Again, it comes back to transparency and, and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Because it's open source, if it's really valuable, somebody can pick it up and fork it and you know, continue on themselves if they like to. So, yep. yeah. Thank you very much. I think we're at a hard stop. Robin told us hard stop. Excellent. Well, thank you again for joining but us. We will happily chat with you afterwards, for sure. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, very much.